All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm Seth Stulen. I'm the Outreach Coordinator for the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies here at the Watson Institute. Um, today we have a wonderful panel um, for our teaching on Puerto Rican resilience and resistance in the aftermath of Hurricane Maria. Um, this is a teaching organized by the Clax Undergraduate Fellows Program, um, which is a program that provides students with the opportunity to gauge with other students here on campus that are interested in, in, in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, the group collectively explores pressing issues facing the region, and individual fellows can receive access to funding and mentorship opportunities. Um, I want to take a moment to thank all of the fellows for conceptualizing and planning this event. We hope it raises more awareness on Puerto Rico and the realities being faced there. I also want to thank the Puerto Rican Association at Brown for their insightful support throughout the planning process. Really, it was, it was incredible to have you all present. Um, now, I want to turn it over to our moderator, a uh, Clax Fellow of ours, um, Ilan Desai-Geller, who is a senior here at Brown concentrating in comparative literature. Ilan is going to be moderating the panel for us. And so um, thank you all for coming, and I hope you enjoy the event. Hi. Um, yeah, thanks again, all of you, for being here. Um, and I'm just going to give a brief introductory uh, remark before turning it over to the panel. So at 6.15 um, a.m. on September 20th, 2017, Hurricane Maria made landfall in Yabucoa, Puerto Rico as a Category 4 hurricane. Um, the statistics of devastation are well known. Uh, that, for example, on October 6th, over two weeks after the storm, 89% of the population had no power, 44% had no water, and 58% had no cellular service. And the power grid continues to suffer from widespread and debilitating blackouts. Today, 210 days after the storm, Puerto Rico suffers its first nationwide blackout since the storm. Um, this is something that continues to be felt. Looking forward, it is estimated that 200,000 people 6% of the archipelago's population will have left permanently by the end of 2018. As we all know, we could go on with these statistics of loss and deprivation all evening long. Um, but suffice it to say that this was and continues to be a generation-defining event. Our intention with this panel, though, as a program, um, was to move past this narrative of destruction and loss um, in order to ask about and emphasize moments of resilience and resistance to learn about the ways Puerto Ricans have responded to and per persevered through the physical, emotional, and communal hardships engendered by the storm. And in doing so, we've thought about recovery and resi uh, resilience, about recovery and rebuilding uh, broadly, not just as acts of literal reconstruction, but also as the myriad artistic, intellectual, and political practices through which communities begin to move on from collective trauma. Um, because it's all of these things that, that are necessary and that are happening. And so, with that said, it is my pleasure to, to introduce our panelists, through whom we hope to, to give some sense of, of, um, of this breadth of activity. So, um, we have Coral Murphy, who is a UPR student currently studying at Brown, Katarina Ramos-Jordan, also a UPR student studying at Brown, Andrew Colaruso, a visiting professor in literary arts, Arturo Masol, who's visiting us from the island, who's the associate director of Casa Pueblo, and Shay Rivera, the artistic director of AS220. Um, and rather than my introducing them more than that, uh, I'd like just briefly to have you all introduce yourselves um, and your work, and um, yeah, to start. Hello, everyone. My name is Coral Murphy. Um, my, I'm a third year student from the University of Puerto Rico, Rio Piedras campus. I study uh, information journalism. Uh, I just want to take a second to thank all of you for coming here today. Hi, my name is Caterina Ramos Jordan. I am a sophomore from the University of Puerto Rico studying comparative literature, and I am also very grateful um, to be here and to have all of you here, um, which is important. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Uh, hi, my name is Andrew Calaruso. I'm uh, visiting assistant professor in the literary arts department. Uh, I'm a writer, uh, fiction, poetry, um, whatever 
I get the opportunity to write, I write. Um, and I'm super grateful to Clax, to Watson. Um, also wanted to give a shout out to um, Marissa Quinn, who had been really a major point person, um, and I think without whom and her support, I never would have got to meet people like Katerina, Coral, um, and a lot of the great students from UPR that, that are here. Um, so, so yeah, looking forward to chopping it up about resilience. Hi, uh, my name is Arturo Masol. I'm a professor at the University of Puerto Rico in, in Mayaguez. I'm a microbiologist. But I'm here as a, as a, as a member of a community-based organization, Casa Pueblo, that we struggle against open pit mining in the 1980s. And, and we're going to become 38 years old in, in a week. So we're celebrating. 38 years of community service. Hi, I'm Shay Rivera, Artistic Director of AS220, Boricua de Corozal. Me mudé acá eight years ago, so very, very honored to be sharing a panel with all of you, especially honored to meet Coral and Caterina and the rest of the students that are here from the island. Special thank you to Brown for supporting, and I'm just excited to hear, um, more excited to see what's going to come out of all of you guys working together. All right, and um, just to, uh, we're, I'm going to ask these questions, and, and you all can respond um, in whatever order you'd like and, or, or not, uh, as the case may be. So in the absence of local government and federal support post Hurricane Maria, um, to what degree have autonomous and self-sustaining initiatives led by community organizations take root, um, taken root, rather, was, was where we were hoping to start. So I was, um, I was just in Puerto Rico last month, and I had the opportunity to work with a group called Mentes Puerto Riqueña en Acción, um, which is a group that's run primarily by students, from what I understand. Uh, but it's a nonprofit organization. And they've done a lot of good work since the hurricane. Um, in fact, it was um, one of the UPR students who had come here, Rosa, um, who had kind of put me in touch with their um, their people. Um, and so I was working with them to help clean up debris, help clean up people's homes, um, and just kind of seeing how um, the water, the, the devastation of the hurricane left a kind of very specific watermark, which would like, you know, would completely engulf like the first floor of a house or like, um, so seeing the damage and also seeing the ways in which young people primarily have been galvanized to work and to rebuild and to help maintain and sustain what was lost has been incredibly impressive. Um, so that was, yeah, Mentes Puerto Riqueña en Acción, but I think there are probably even more, many, many more organizations um, that are doing a lot of great work on the ground. Um, I think it's important to mention that right after the hurricane, the <coughs> first people that ever helped the people was the people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Before any organization, before the government, before anyone else showed up, it was the people who grabbed their machetes and they cleaned whatever needed to be cleaned right after the hurricane. I think we need to emphasize that the people are what is most important and the most important group of people that helped after the hurricane. Besides the people, um, I'm really glad that communities, small communities, stood together, churches, and just neighbors, they stood up in solidarity, and they helped each other out before any government-funded organizations did. And now that I mention government-funded organizations, I think it's important to mention that a lot of people have not trusted the government-led organizations that were meant to help Hurricane Maria. Because of this lack of trust, a lot of people wanted to help Puerto Rico in many different ways, but they were skeptical on whether they should donate money and to who. So I think before donating, I think it's important to first do research on what organization you are donating to. I know it can be really hard to know what organization is affiliated to what, but before you do anything, 
everyone should do their proper research and see if any organization is affiliated with any other thing that the money might not go to good use. Yeah, I'd like to jump in on that also. Uh, mad respect, because <laughs> Casa Pueblo is here, yes. and they're like one of the elder, like stronghold, powerful, amazing community initiatives that have been has been doing work for years. So I just want to note that. <laughs> I want to say that there was a government response, uh, because there's a local government with limited power, but everything after the hurricane was federalized. federalized. So the federal government took over the power energy restoration with water infrastructure. And what they have done with Puerto Rico is basically a mistreatment of the people of Puerto Rico. So they, they have done something, mistreated the people of Puerto Rico. Uh, in places where, where communities were organized, the, the consequences and the perception of, of the aftermath of Hurricane Maria was different. In some communities, people were, I think everyone was a victim of, of, of the natural disaster, I mean of the natural event. But a natural disaster was created basically because, because of that government response. It's man-made created. Uh, in the case of, of Casa Pueblo, uh, we have been running with solar power, for example, since 1999, for almost 20 years. And right after, the day after of, of the hurricane, we were able to open the house. We have power. People were getting in and plugging in their, their t respiratory therapy machines or, or their cellular phones. We have a radio station, so people came came to Casa Pueblo to communicate to others in their communities and to use our social media network to, communi to communicate with others away from Anjuntas about uh, that they were safe, uh, about their needs. Immediately after that, we, we decided to engage actively with the diaspora and people from Brown University, from, from Massachusetts, Boston, Texas, New York, Idaho, even Arizona, California, Michigan, from multiple places, uh, were very supportive of what Casa Pueblo wanted to do. And what we wanted to do was to light up Puerto Rico with the sun. That was our first campaign, to light up Puerto Rico with the sun. And instead of asking people for money, we, we were telling students to actively engage by by getting a solar lamp and sending them to us uh, in order to distribute them to the people of Adjuntas. And with that uh, initiative, we were able to distribute up to 14,000 lamps. Adjuntas has 18,000 people. But not only for Adjuntas, we, we help uh, nearby municipalities and communities in, in Salinas, even in Vieques, we send 1,000 Loiza. La Perla and others. And the idea was to quickly help the quality of life at that time of crisis by embracing renewable energy sources to help the elderly reduce their, their, their risk of, of falling down at night or to make kids feel safer at night and build community, even, even within, the, the, within that situation. But in, in, in addition to just providing the item, there was a, an intention to educate the people that our energy system is obsolete and that we need to change our energy agenda. After that, we helped 10 families to, with a solar energy system with small refrigerators uh, and, a, and for their insulin and all the medical supplies, and also to energize a small appliance. And we went to Maria's house, actually her name is Maria, a dialysis patient, uh, and she was unable to run her dialysis equipment, and we designed uh, an energy system to run her dialysis equipment. And we helped her, as well as, as other families, uh, with special medical needs. 
It happens that yesterday, the medical group in, in charge of, of dealing with, with problem, kidney problems and, and diabetes, uh, diabetes patient, they said that, that the number of dialysis patients in Puerto Rico tripled after the hurricane, has tripled since the hurricane. Three to four deaths every single day in Puerto Rico because of dialysis problem. And we were helping Maria and we shared the setup and the point is that there's a, an alternative uh, setup that Puerto Rico must pursue in order to deal with the current situation but also to be better prepared for the future. We energize a, a, our radio transmitter, we energize a barber shop, and today the report, news report from Radio Casa Pueblo after the blackout is that El Barbero Perez is still cutting hair and earning his, his salary because his barber shop is running with solar power. The other news we got is that Maria is still getting dialysis because she's running her personal dialysis machine with solar power. And we got another news that, that dozens of families in different brutal areas of Adjuntas, their, their refrigi refrigerators are still energized because they're, ru they're running solar refrigerators that Casa Pueblo have been given to different families in, in all the neighborhoods of Adjuntas. They're so efficient that one solar power is enough to generate the energy needs for that equipment. And in, 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 on Sunday, we're going to celebrate 38 years, and we're going to present the first house fully solar power, Doña Martina in Calle del Agua, and we're going to present the first mini market in the rural areas for economical activation and food security for the community that is also going to be energized with solar power. And in two weeks, we're going to inaugurate the first solar cinema in Puerto Rico. That's amazing. Imagine having the solar cinema available right before the hurricane. You know, people going to the cine to watch a movie and have the opportunity for entertainment the day after the hurricane. The natural event, we survived the natural event. What we're having difficulties is surviving the government disaster in Puerto Rico. That's so, uh, do you mind if I jump in? Yes. Um, I just, it's just such an inspiring example of what Coral was just saying, because I, I just want to flag two things that we continue to unpack, hopefully, in the panel, is like how have, what is responsible activism and community mobilizing, and then also just how the awareness that people were mobilizing in the island, and there's also the role that the diaspora played, and it was the one of the very few moments, if not the only, that folks from the island and in the diaspora were con connected and united to mobilize folks responsibly. And um, the other thing I just wanted to get a sense from the panel, how many people here are from Puerto Rico or are Boricua in any shape or form? Cool, that's awesome. That's great, and who are allies? <laughs> Fantastic. Well, it's just a big thank you, but also awareness that it's like, this is a heavy topic for all of us. So just to kind of acknowledge that, and thank you for your patience. But yeah, I would love to hear more about um, just those examples of socially responsible activism. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of folks here, just from my experience um, in the middle of all this. So I left eight years ago, but all my family is over there. We, myself, and um, actually a friend, Anabel, curadora, curator as well, activist, uh, activist and artist, many of us were trying to mobilize to figure out what are the places that we needed to inform folks that they should support, Casa Pueblo being one of them, and really kind of like showing the light to some of the other uh, institutions that were trying to just to get money for the government and that we felt were not a responsible way to um, support the community. So just hopefully we can talk more about that too along the way. Yeah, um, I want to add to that that um, I agree with you and I think we're going to talk about um, that a little bit more, but I think we need to create consciousness that transna building transnational bridges yep. 
through activism, through art, through education, is essential in this moment of history in Puerto Rico. And like not, you know, having the diaspora and, and Puerto Rico collaborate is so essential, you know, without prejudice, without uh, any um, like false preconceptions of, of what that might entail for certain ideologies in the islands, um, political ideologies specifically. Mm -hmm. And, you know, right now there's 5.4 um, 5 million um, Puerto Ricans living in the United States mm -hmm. versus, what, 3.4 million and that are being reduced um, day to day because, you know, people are leaving. And, and I think it, in this, this moment is crucial um, for that transnational activism to happen. Um, you know, in any way possible. And I just want to add to a little, a little of a historical note that in 1898, when the island was invaded by the United States, the writer from the New York Times, Fisk, um, wrote that Puerto Ricans were incapable of self-government as a justification for the invasion and total control um, of co the colonial power of the United States. And he said in the article, which is very famous, that the genius institutions of the U.S. were going to aid the island until they show themselves capable of fit. And now 120, 120 years later, we see that they are not responding, and the federal govern, government is not taking responsibility for our colonial status. And that being said, um, the people have to respond. And I think it's a lesson for Puerto Ricans to, um, you know, it's a lesson um, of, of resilience and, and the, I mean, what Coral said is so important because it was the people and I think we are totally capable of self-government because um, as the people, um, we have been, you know, Casa Pueblo and so many other organizations have been um, who, the ones that have taken responsibility for our own um, rebuilding and 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 good or yeah <laughs> adding a little bit to that i definitely agree with you about building transnational bridges it's definitely important which is why i definitely want to give a big shout out to the Puerto Rican Association. Mm -hmm. They've helped us so much. When we talk about organizations yeah. that aren't um, part of the local government or federal mm. government, government, we're talking about also institutions like Brown University that gave us an education, gave us food, gave us everything for free, and helped us after a really rough moment. So we really want to thank Galenia and um, yeah. Brown University and these other universities, not just Brown, like. Um, New York University, uh, Tulane University, uh, University of South Florida, all of these universities that really came together and helped all of these students that really wanted to continue their education and weren't certain about what was going to happen to our university. And they stood up, and I'm pretty sure this wouldn't have happened, I guess, Brown without the Puerto Rican Association, all the Puerto Ricans that really wanted to help in any way, shape, or form. And I'm pretty sure all of the other Puerto Ricans and all of these other universities stood up and wanted to do something um, in solidarity to everyone in the island. Thank you all for that. Um, and, and I wanted to pick up on something that Caterina, you said in Arturo too, that um, you know, if the, if the, if the U.S. government came in claiming to, to um, aid the island, um, we now know um, and see, or I guess it's always, we've always known, but now we see again um, ever more clearly that it's in fact the U.S. government's um, intervention which has made this into a disaster from a natural event. Um, and, and so what are the ways um, that you see um, in, in movements um, and, and resistance efforts and recovery efforts that, that resilience has been, has been um, incorporated in terms of making the island more, um, more resilient, uh, to repeat a word, uh, to, to future storms like these? Um, and what are the ways that, that organizing in the aftermath of, of the hurricane has, has tried to make itself more sustainable? Um, I want to jump in on that and maybe um, take this a little bit um, to a broader context to kind of start a little bit fresh. 
So to build upon what Arturo was saying and uh, both of you were commenting, this is a problem that's been happening for a long time. Mm -hmm. We've been colonized for a long time. And that mentality of colonization continues to tell our people that we're not enough and that we're not able to support ourselves, which has been a lie. And there's a lot of intellectual property that has come out of the island, immense, like amazing innovative movements like the community land trust movement, so many things, environmental justice, all that stuff. But um, I think it was two or three years ago, two, three, two years ago, that uh, the PROMESA bill was passed. So the PROMESA bill, uh, bill established a fiscal oversight board over Puerto Rico. Um, and that um, mobilized a lot of people because we felt like that was a, a human rights violation in many, in many ways. And what this board would do, it's again, take away that, um, as Puerto Rico was Estado Libre Asociado, free associated state. So it meant that we were supposed to have a government. A lot of people fought for that right throughout the years because when we were colonized, we did not have that right. But then the PROMESA bill establishing this committee was a moment where that right was taken away. So that committee could overrule the government. We were also seeing a large economic crisis build up. When I moved here eight years ago, that crisis was bubbling up. It didn't just happen out of nowhere. For many, many years, our industries have been mined by US corporations and illegal tax breaks that people get in Puerto Rico. And in other states, they would never do that. So there's a, there's a racial component of it where people of color were in a colonized state and a lot of things that, uh, a lot of regulations were passed that should have been illegal. Um, so that was building up, and like Arturo was saying, I mean, the hurricane just lifted the veil on what was really deep um, problems of colonization. So now to bring it back to your question of uh, resilience, resilience is just a term for things that we've just been doing for a very long time. I'm glad that there is a word for it now. Um, I'm glad that we can use it to our advantage, but it only, just to remember that that's what we've been doing for all these years. And then to Arturo's point, like how before we jumped on the panel, you mentioned that the mobilizing around social energy was a way to unify folks. In Puerto Rico, partisanship has been very devastating to our communities because people choose to just uh, vouch for this idea of whether statehood or not, and that will be the savior of all our problems. And that's a problem because then investments don't happen. But how really amazing it has been that solar energy and resilience and resistance and sustainability have been a place of unity, huh? Could I? So just to, to kind of piggyback off what Shay is saying, I think there's a way in which the term resilience um, obfuscates other issues, right? It's easy to, to rely on resilience, but I, I think it's kind of a jargony academic term um, that has kind of picked up steam after the 50s, after certain longitudinal psychological studies by um, Emmy Werner and Ruth Stone, right? So kind of assessing what is psychological resilience um, and, you know, defining it, right? So they found that one in three at-risk children had this thing which could be identified as resilience. Um, fast forward, another psychologist, uh, George Bonanno, published findings that um, made a distinction between what is resilience and what is recovery, right? Mm -hmm. Which is to say that resilience is a coping mechanism. And as Shea said, we've been coping for years under um, colonial rule, I mean, well, centuries of colonial rule, right? Like 400, 300, 400 years of colonial rule. Um, and so I think there's a way in which we, we have relied on resilience, but what we really need is recovery. And what we really need is to address fundamental wounds that have gone unaddressed mm -hmm. for centuries and continue to fester without proper treatment. Um, and I think it's a problem because there are people like Arturo on the ground who are doing the work that we need, but these efforts are constantly being undermined by the US government, by the sovereign um, that has 100% of the power, political power, over what happens um, in Puerto Rico. Now what we have, of course, is our resilience, is our capacity to make certain interpersonal choices and social choices. Um, but that governmental oversight, which we're seeing in, in terrible, terrible measure with PROMESA, um, is really, again, undermining efforts by people like Arturo to galvanize people on the ground, um, as Coral was saying. And, um, and I think it's, it's incredibly insidious. Um, and 
Yeah, something that I've kind of been banging my head against the wall thinking about. So I am a biologist, <laughs> and resiliency and is an ecological term as well, mm -hmm. and it, it is the means that a community, a biological community, deals with uh, the ability to deal with disturbances. And uh, to be more resilient for biological community, diversity is a key factor. Higher diversity, higher resiliency. Um, so what you see in Puerto Rico, from, from the government point of view, and if you look at Puerto Rico, is that we're becoming less resilient. So it's not like, like they're building or, or the recovery is directed to, to make Puerto Rico more resilient. Actually, we're more vulnerable. And what we have seen with uh, PROMESA and even before is that all the austerity measurements, the people are, and that diversity within the society is paying the consequences of the austerity measurements. And if you see, for example, the power authority, well, they don't have the potential and the capacity to rebuild because it has been destroyed. People have been fired. The mm -hmm. unit for maintenance and, and restoration are no longer uh, active. So we rely on people from outside to go to plug in some cables and stuff that could be done in Puerto Rico. Uh, so what we do in Casa Pueblo, uh, I know the government and the Congress has a political power. We have no control upon that. We don't have the economical power. Uh, but we can build on social power. That's what we have. And we have to build on that. And we, we cannot rely on politicians. Mm -hmm. and we don't deal with politicians, with none of them. Uh, we rely on ourselves. And we want to take control of our own destiny by our own means. And if you look of what Casa Pueblo have been doing after the hurricane, that is not that different from before the hurricane. It's not about charity. It's not about perpetuating the, need, the needs of the people. Mm -hmm. It's about engaging in a restoration, in active, uh, in, act, in actions to change reality. And that's what we want to do, to change the reality of our local community, changing the local landscape, promoting a new reference for the energy agenda from the bottom up instead of waiting for the fiscal board, for the private sector, for the US Congress to impose what they think from the top to the bottom in a situation that is clearly politically unbalanced in which local people, they don't have access to the document, there's no transparency, no participation. So what are we gonna do? Protesting is one thing, and I think we have to do it, but we have to build new references. And I think the record of Casa Pueblo is speaks for itself is because we have been doing 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 and we're not going to get stopped if the if the laws and, and the congress and the politicians is, if they think uh those things should not be done we're going to do it <laughs> period and i think it is it is it is we need good ideas uh we need good thoughts but we need participation we need action, doing things that are, are at reach and in actively engaging in, in building a real resilience community, yeah. like the barbershop, that now he's resilient. There's no power in Puerto Rico, but he's still working. Uh, so the re resiliency can be built, can be designed, uh, and we have to use our knowledge and our will uh, to do it. Yeah, I love that. I feel that that's exactly the key. I think instead of, I don't think about new references, but more like old references and the work that we've been doing for all these years. But I completely agree. I've been thinking a lot. So at AS220, we focus on socially responsible urban development. And we're all artists. Artists who were kicked out of spaces in the 80s, and then they were able to fight for a space. And now we own it. And now in downtown, it's so unaffordable. We're the only ones that provide affordable housing and affordable and equitable space for people to make and create. The reason why I moved here 
I'm from Puerto Rico was because I wanted to build a place like this back home at some point. And it just like this conversation just reinforces those same values are so important. I've been reading a lot. I love that you connected emer uh, resilience to the biological aspect of it. I've been reading um, Emergent Strategies by Adrienne Marie Brown. And I just feel like she zones in on how these collective movements of fungi and like collective insects and just like they build systems within themselves to empower a pluralistic movement where we can push forward. So again, to elevate what Caterina and Coral said, where it's like, it is about the people, like, and we're the ones responding on the floor, on the ground. Even in the diaspora, like, we responded faster than the government did. Like, we were stuck in this place of not knowing what was going on and knowing too much. Because then we would connect to Facebook, where it was like messages of despair, because a lot of people could only connect to Facebook, they couldn't connect via phone. And then we were trying to figure out checking in on que municipio, which municipality, who would found their cousin, who found their abuela, who found their uncle, sharing information, creating these streams. And like the way that we operate as a culture, we don't go and flaunt that. Like we don't go and like claim ourselves as activists. We just respond and are wired to do community work. And so it was interesting as a person here, and many of us felt the same way, where I even had people telling me like, there's nothing you can do. Like you need to focus on here and there's nothing you can do. And I'm like, I'm sorry, but I'm mobilizing a lot of information and like holding space for people. There's healing space that needed to happen. Folks from, Lo I was um, in Loisaida, shout out to them, a cultural center in the Lower East Side in Puerto Rico who have been battling gentrification and they are doing amazing work there. The ladies, the women, the activists from Eco Kids Puerto Rico were mobilized there. They were sending packages to Casa Pueblo and other places. A lot of us were trying to figure out who and what and what was necessary. And also like to the point of socially responsible activism, learning and the transnational connection, learning from sisters and brothers and kin from the Standing Rock movement and the native movements over here, the uh, black African American Southern movements, like all the knowledge that they've built, that actually helped me understand, oh, there's a lot of people just creating fundraisers to just get their faces out there and for political gain. And the questions were like, who are you connected to? Are you talking to anybody in the island? Do you know anybody in the island? And what is your affiliation? So just to highlight the point of transcultural and transnational, like we're mixed race. One of the things that really upsets me about like all these conversations around Latinx is that there's a lot of cultural erasure that is going toward that, you know, I, I like Latinx, let's say that, but I do think we need to unpack the fact that we are mixed race. And resilience does come from like, many, many years of cultural backgrounds and mobilizing our people. But I think that that's something that's often forgotten. So the more we can build bridges with other cultures here and create space of empathy and connection and family to strengthen each other and learn from each other's movements, I feel like that's totally the key. The key to keep building community, the key to fight against capitalism and white supremacy and just continue to build upon grassroots community organizing as the key to rebuild our countries and cities. Our government, question mark. I think um, going back to the question, I also want to mention some other movements, um, for example, in, in agriculture that has been happening. So there's this community of chefs and, and agriculture, specifically from a restaurant that is called the Departamento de la Comida. Um, and they are creating what's called La Guagua Solidaria, which is basically, they are going, it's a beautiful project um, um, driven by young people, primarily in collaboration with um, a little huerto that is um, in the UPR right now, that is happening in the UPR, and they basically go around um, Puerto Rico to different um, communities and specifically schools to teach um, children about agriculture and about sustainability. And I think Arturo, um, I'm I'm overwhelmed with joy um, and and pride by the work that you're you guys are doing. And I think I totally agree that the the change is from the people, for the people, by the people, and. Um, we must not, you know, that, that has to be the North. And um, I lost my thought right there. 
but um yeah sustainability um you know food sustainability um energy sustainability sustainability is also key um in in that process of of organizing peoples because for example food sustainability of course agriculture is very you know in the face of a natural disaster um it's very fragile in terms of like the hurricane can take everything away right but um, having the practice and the consciousness of that we can build our food in our backyard is so important to be, you know, and, and in the face of, of J the Jones Act, for example, mm. which is a Merchant Marine Act um, passed in 1920 that limits our, our commerce and our international credit, um, I think that's very important to talk about. And that limits the, the food that is imported to Puerto Rico and export it as well. And so by these efforts, a community efforts of sustainability, we are resisting that act and, and hopefully it will be revoked in the future. But, you know, it's just, yeah, I'm just echoing what um, Shay and Arturo have said because it's so essential to understand. I just want to like add a quick note about um, resilience. Um, <laughs> I guess I, I listen to the I've listened to the word a lot because of the circumstances were very emotionally strong because of the hurricane we went through a lot of things but I just want to point out that even though the Puerto Rican community is resilient we shouldn't have to be we shouldn't have to be resilient we shouldn't have to be emotionally strong we have we're supposed to have a government who's supposed to take care of us give us food give us water in moments when we most need it so I don't if 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 it weren't for people like Arturo that are resilient for groups like Casa Pueblo that you know are res completely resilient Puerto Rico wouldn't have survived like it did hopefully more people like Arturo create more ways more resources and hopefully better the resources that we have in Puerto Rico solar power like that's that's great having a a movie theater that's completely run by solar power houses hopefully this can open the space for improvement but that's how you build an alternative government mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yep. one that is driven by different values and and what do you say arturo don't, don't make it personal uh, <laughs> it's a lot of pressure there's no there's a lot of people uh that are work for casa pueblo who actually do most of the work. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with power mapping, when they try to map, you know, relationship between different groups. I think if we do that for, for, for Casa Pueblo and all the transnational relationships that we have, possibly a lot of the credit of what I'm telling you right now comes from, from, from here, from there, from New York, from the others who have seen Casa Pueblo and trust Casa Pueblo and they trust the people in Mariana and Umacao and they trust the people in Loiza and the guys from Idebajo in Salinas. And they said the best way to channel help for them to help others is by going through this path. Um, and that's what we have been doing, getting a lot of work because people are, trying, are helping us in order for us to help others. So the credit mm -hmm. goes beyond Casa Pueblo and Arturo Masol. I mean, th there's a lot of ways that people are participating. Many of them are unaware, mm -hmm. but I think they do exist and they need, need to be understand because we can build on that. Uh, we are about breaking dependencies. We want to break the economical dependency, the energy dependency, uh, food dependency. We're we're planting coffee because we, we, we our economical uh, activity to support Casa Pueblo is Café Madre Isla, for example. But talking about an example of dependency is, is water after the hurricane. Mm -hmm. So people were brought water from the state. One gallon of water weighs eight pounds. So you have to take that water to San Juan in an airplane and then send it to different parts of, of Puerto Rico, including Adjuntas, and people of Adjuntas were getting gallons of, waters, of water when it was raining. 
and we had plenty of water systems nearby at Juntas, and we said, wait, wait, what, what are we doing? Uh, why not giving them water filters? You know, the ability to make the water potable, mm -hmm. not for one instance, but for, to deal with the crisis and to be better prepared for the future. And that, that's what we have been doing as well, dealing with the energy, also with the water crisis, but breaking the model of dependency, because at some point, people, they, they refused getting the, they, they didn't want the water filters, because they, they needed to operate the water filters, and they needed to learn how to use it. Those things happen yeah. as well. Is it not? You want water, you have to make your water bottle. We're going to show you how, and you have to work for it. Uh, and we have to break that model of dependency uh, from the government, from the politicians, from economical systems. I think we have to build on one of what we have. Uh, and again, this is what we believe, and, and that's why we have so actively engaged with others dealing during this hurricane situation, but thinking mostly on the future of Puerto Rico. Thank you. Um, and I'll just ask one more question before we open it up to the audience, um, which is in many ways the, the most important one. Um, but w what are the, the end goals of, of your work? Um, and, and more specifically, um, what are the ways that diaspora communities um, and, and allies can help you um, get there? guys mind if I jump in? All right. Um, the end goal, to build upon what Arturo was saying, is to, we are going through a process of unlearning and our people too, plus a process of reactivating self-determination. Mm -hmm. And it's about rebuilding trust in each other and in ourselves. So from a person who works in the arts, socially engaged arts, to create awareness and education and participation, but also thinks about sustainable just cities, I think that our, from my end only, is to be able to inspire people to take control and ownership of our own narrative and actively participate in it and take control of building and envisioning our own future for the island and for the diaspora, and what does it mean for us as Puerto Ricans and Boricuas being transnational. If we don't take control of envisioning our futures, other people will continue to determine things for us. And I feel like that's the role of the arts in it. I feel super proud that in Puerto Rico, so many artists stood up. There are so many negative connotations that people have about artists. The artists are neighbors, they're community organizers. They were taking the streets, they were opening community kitchens, they were making bridges of connection, they were elevating the work of grassroots organizations. And I just feel like opening space for people to envision, and now it's up to us, like, what do we want a vision for Puerto Rico? What is Puerto Rico for us now and in the future? We need to determine that. And it can't be from a colonial perspective. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that, how artists stood up in Puerto Rico, especially. Um, I was there um, just a month after the hurricane, before I came here. But I definitely saw how just you know within a month, artists stood up. Um, and for example, um, there is a very um, famous rock venue in Puerto Rico called El Local. Um, anyone who likes rock in Puerto Rico knows about it. And it opened a community kitchen just a week after the hurricane happened. It was completely free to anyone. And it was just, I was so amazed by that, how a rock venue um, opened. And I, I saw it in a, a, a magazine called Pitchfork here. And it was like, wow, I can't believe how big this got. It spread and it was great. Um, so yeah, definitely. Um, as a person kind of in the arts, I mean, journalism accounts, um, mm -hmm. writing. Um, yeah, I guess my end goal is to help Puerto Rico in the way I can by just transmitting the news how it is objectively and what's going on and to help the people. I don't care who is, you know, I just want to help the people and I guess kind of a bit of a tangent, like I just kind of felt very embarrassed by the fact that the people, the publications that were 
um, publishing things about Puerto Rico and controversies in Puerto Rico were newspapers in the United States. How Politico, the New York Times, and um, the Washington Post were the people that you know, did investigations about the hurricane and corruptions in the government and economical, uh, economic corruptions. And I, I said, like, why? You know, if you have great Puerto Rican journalists in Puerto Rico, why are, you know, uh, the, why is the Washington Post, why is the New York Times, or why are they the ones that are, you know, doing an actual good job reporting about your country? Mm -hmm. Like, we need to stand up and we need to help in that way. And I guess that's the way I feel like I could help Puerto Rico if I can work for a publication that will really, you know, let me publish something and investigate something without, you know, repercussions. Um, I think going off of what Jay said, I think the arts and, and, you know, the artistic and creative and cultural production that has come out of, of Maria is a perfect example of how the arts are, of course, not as necessary as biological needs and like immediate responses, but they complement um, and they complement each other greatly in, in, in a number of ways. But and they fulfill the need of of coping with trauma, mm -hmm. and and of basically, you know, healing the soul, the spirit, whatever you want to call it. And, and I think art functions in that way in that it recounts the narratives from different perspectives. Um, and it is our way of, of responding in, in a more subjective, personal way. But I think in that there is so much value. And, and from that, it could, that could be um, a point to further, you know, draw a line and like connect for activism or simply community organizing, um, which is equally, you know, and, and art built on, I think in this moment, a, another dimension of national identity, which I think Puerto Rican national identity is so complex, you know, because in the United States, we're second-class citizens, and in Puerto Rico, we're Puerto Rican, we're Boricuas. And, and so as our, the de our identity is so complex, I think the hurricane, artistic responses to the hurricane have really and somewhat unify, um, and, and of course, all the acts of resilience of, um, has unify our sense of Puerto Ricanidad, um, I think, from La Diaspora and in, in, the, in Puerto Rico. Um, and as a student and as an aspiring writer, um, I personally think, I think getting, you know, creating art that kind of helps people heal, um, I think it's very essential for me and, and yeah. I think I unfortunately side with the ugly truth, and I think ultimately the the um, the goal is self determination. It is sovereignty. It is um, economic and biological, ecological self sufficiency, agricultural self sufficiency. Um, but I think my immediate goal has been strategic agitation, um, because I think. There's a way in which, again, like the notion of resilience is very, um, it's important. I mean, and it has been important. I think without resilience, Puerto Rico would not be here today. Puerto Rico has gone through so many catastrophic moments, right? And um, perseveres, survives, um, in part because of this resilience that's on the ground. Um, and that is part of the national identity. Espiritu um, del. Pitirre, right? Like mm -hmm. the little bird that mm. that is more powerful even than or can resist the um, right the the, the, um, hawk. the hawk the um, the red tail. So something that for me is very interesting and is kind of like my immediate goal is to kind of remain in the position of a Jeremiah, right? 
and by that, I mean, so there are two moments in the book of Jeremiah for me that are super important, and reading the Bible is kind of personally important for me, but um, I just wanted to share these two moments, right? So in Jeremiah chapter 2, Jeremiah, who's famous, agitated prophet, right? First here, then there, you flit about, going from one ally to another for their help, but it's all no good. Your new friends in Egypt will forsake you as Assyria did before. You will be left in despair and cover your face with your hands, for the Lord has rejected the ones that you trust. You will not succeed despite their aid, right? If you substitute Egypt and Assyria for the US and Spain, right, you have a kind of formula for colonial dependence that I think Jeremiah was railing against um, in, in his speech and in his life, I guess. There's another moment, which we've kind of already talked about um, in Jeremiah. In some translations, it's you can't heal a wound by saying it's not there, right? And so I, I think, again, we can talk about resilience, but I think we can't obfuscate the fact that um, it's going to take more than resilience. It's going to take a kind of agitation. It's going to take renewed national identity. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to take breaking through class distinctions in Puerto Rico, which is an incredibly heterogeneous group of people. Mm -hmm. That diversity often works against us politically because we are so divided, right? So I have family who anytime I propose the notion of independence or sovereignty, it's like, well, do you want us to become the Dominican Republic? Do you want us to become Haiti, right? And that also already kind of um, betrays certain fundamental prejudices we have within the Caribbean. Yeah, absolutely. Right? This, mm -hmm. like, because we've enjoyed a sense of prosperity that's fundamentally inextricably tied to the US's economic fluctuations, um, it's almost like we d part of us do kind of walk around with like the notion that our shit don't stink in the Caribbean yep. because we've had you know a kind of um, luxury but the problem is now that like the US economy is going to shit and our economy will also go to shit because of its inextricable link to it right so um, in Spanish that particular passage is um, in uh, Nueva, Nueva Traducción Viviente Ofrecen curas superficiales para la herida mortal de mi pueblo. Dan garantías de paz cuando no hay paz. Right? And so this is where I'm at, right? There's no peace here. And I'm fundamentally profoundly agitated um, to the point where I almost don't even want to talk about resilience because I see resilience. I saw it working with Mentes Puerto Riqueña and it felt like not enough right? Mm -hmm. to just clean up to help people clean up. And I think the people that I was working with in um, Toa Baja, you know, there was a kind of gallows humor to it. It's like, yeah, you know, we're cleaning up, but like, shit's still fucked up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, I think for me, it's, it's strategic agitation. Like how do we connect bridges within the island, within, you know, transnationally as well? How do we bridge class and cultural gaps um, where, you know, I think there's also an education. I mean, education is a real problem now because the government is aligned to really destroy education in Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And there's also, again, a kind of prejudice, a working class prejudice against students, um, university students who do a lot of great work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But Absolutely. working class people in Puerto Rico don't necessarily see the value of that work. Um, and. So I, I will get off my little Jeremiah pulpit, but I think just to, um, to recap, yeah, strategic agitation and awakening. Um. Um, I think I want to do a small comment um, on that, and I think I, I share your agitation. And as a student, as a 20-year-old, I mean, I'm in a constant questioning of what can I do for my country. and, and how can I not feel impotent almost um, in, in times? So yeah. <clears throat> well, in, in our case, it's about finding means for breaking uh, dependencies of all levels, uh, taking up op over our own destiny and about the protection of our natural resources for, for the present and for future generations. Mm -hmm. um, I have to tell you, Coral, that many of the reports from, from the state 
it's not that they're better reporters than the people from Puerto, reporters from Puerto oh, Rico, no. but the access to information in Puerto Rico is a huge problem. Uh, and I think that shows access to information in Puerto Rico is not the same as people from outside searching and getting access to that information. In other instances, like the, the work about the death in, in Puerto Rico after the hurricane, uh, that was done by Puerto Ricans reporters. Uh, they were not taken into seriously locally until CNN and New York Times and others pick up on what they did. And all of a sudden, it was an important piece of information to understand the, 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 the consequences of, of the Hurricane Maria in, in Puerto Rico. I think, I mean, just to jump in, having met Coral, she was the first person to make me aware of that fact. Okay. The, the access to information for journalists in Puerto Rico. It's I mean, uh, it, the journal journalism there is held to the same rigorous standard, mm -hmm. but there is a fundamental blocking that's happening. Exactly. Well, it's because the media is owned by people with specific interests, yeah. and they're also really fantastic um, Puerto Ricans writing in the diaspora, like Ed Morales, Francis Negro, and so many people. Mm -hmm. But then the power structures are still yeah. white journalists, mm -hmm. and then instead of inviting people that are actually doing the work, our stories get co-opted. So yeah. then that's part of the problem to me. Sorry to... No, no, don't worry. And, and with regard to the art, uh, I won't invite you all of you to go to, if you go to Puerto Rico, go to Casa Pueblo. We have good coffee, uh, <laughs> Cafe Madre Isla. Uh, and when you get to the house, it's an old house. It's so beautiful. Huge doors and windows. Uh, when you get to the living room, you're gonna see a photograph of one person showing up at the main square when we called for our first protest. So for the open pit mining, we, we knew and we got all the knowledge about how mining was bad for Puerto Rico. We have all the scientific data and, and, and all the necessary arguments, the knowledge for people to understand mining and, and do something about it. And yet, only one person show up at the main square. So after that point, 1981, a year after, one year after we started getting organized, we knew that knowledge itself was not enough. You cannot promote changes in society just based on knowledge. And if you think about how from one person for our main uh, first protest, eventually 30 years after we, we have a protest against a, a pipeline going through Puerto Rico, we had 30,000 instead of one uh, showing up at the same main square. Uh, and the, and the, how we deal with that was we reach a, a different understanding. We knew that knowledge was not, not enough, so our social equation to promote changes in, in, in society is knowledge, of course, scientific knowledge, uh, traditional knowledge, there's different means to get knowledge, plus culture mm -hmm. that give us identity, plus the community equals changes. Mm -hmm. So for us, you need the three ingredients. You need the community, you need the culture, and you need the knowledge. And after the Hurricane Maria, one of the first things we, we did, we had like four different uh, compañías de teatro, like uh, theater, 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 groups. Theater, groups. theater groups going to Adjuntas and, and, and helping us rebuild the self-esteem of the people to, because we, want them, we wanted them to actively engage in dealing with the situation. You need a healthy self-esteem. You need mm -hmm. a good communication, meaning you need to, to get a, a sense of, of identity and, and build on that. Um, we have a school of music in Casa Pueblo, and uh, we have a writer in Puerto Rico, Eduardo Lalo, who wrote a piece on Casa Pueblo, and he said, mm -hmm. if you go to Casa Pueblo, you, you can learn about biodiversity, and right after, they will show you how to play the, the clarinet. So you can see, 
either way. You can get mm. either knowledge, both experience, all type of experience, cultural and scientific, uh, at the same location. And I think uh, that's how we have been working ever since in, in, in Anjuntas. Embracing culture, science, and community. I want to highlight that's so beautiful too, just making me feel so proud and lucky to be in the panel. Um, that part of what you guys were speaking to as well, the role of community members, but also the, the students. Like the UPR, the University of Puerto Rico, is like the heart of the island. Like every single student that has been there has been transformed. Um, we have a very educated society, like one of the highest uh, percentages of people who go to college because it's so affordable. We actually get Pell Grants, and Senator Pell is from Rhode Island. Pell Grant is $4,000. When I went to the UPR, that covered for my whole undergrad, and that was the only way I could go to college. Another UPR, UPR people. <laughs> but it's like that was a hotbed of culture and identity and liberation, and it was so wonderful. And like people were active, and we connected with the workers' movements. When there was a paro, we were there, all of us camping out. It was a strong sense of identity and love for our, our country. And I feel like that's actually something that's not seen here in the US. In fact, I've heard a lot of folks from Brown, from RISD, from other universities speak to this um, deficit and be accessing opportunities within their campus to understand their social agency. We have that, and I'm so proud that we do. And it is, you're right, education is under siege, and specifically because they want to privatize everything. Mm -hmm. But um, that's where, like, what you were saying, Arturo, is so key. It's like, we, we live and breathe culture, and that's our way of being. And it's even folks here in the U.S. are trying to reproduce that, but we have it and it's our strength. So how do we continue to keep it and build upon it is what is exciting to me. And I love your formula. Like at AS220, we always talk about, well, our role is if you have access, if you have privilege, then you open it up, you burst the box open. Because it's about giving space, allowing for space to happen where people can have access to people, to knowledge, to tools, and to resources so that they can self-actualize. And I feel like that's a, a, kind of like a parallel to what all of you guys are saying as well. All right, thank you all so much. Um, and if we could have a round of applause for our panelists. <laughs> and uh, we'll open it up now. So any questions? Yeah, in the red shirt. Thank you all for coming here today. Um, my question, you, I forget who it was exactly, but there was a mentioning of distrust in terms of federal organizations that had been built. Um, if you could speak a little bit about if that could be verbalized in any way, like sort of, is it experiences in the past or is, what, what are things that led sort of to that distrust? Is it, is, is there one thing greater than another? Is it length of time waited for some of these needs? Um, or is it, as Arturo mentioned, maybe sort of sending the wrong things? And like, is there one thing that felt worse than another? And is this something that's been building over time or something that happened mostly after this earthquake? Uh, uh, how much time do we have? <laughs> 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 Let's um, go back to 1600. Um, yeah, I mean, we have until six. We have the room yeah. until the six. Answer, the the post, answer is colonization. Post. Yeah. So, so, so let me be specific. Sorry, sorry. sorry. So post disaster. So maybe like, I'm thinking FEMA, but I'm, I know there are more organizations. But specifically disaster relief. So, um, you know. Our hope sometimes is that organizations like FEMA step up to the plate and do what's needed and after a disaster. Um, and often we hear of grievances. I mean, there, there are grievances after the Texas hurricanes. Um, and, and now again, we hear it here. And time and time again, it seems like FEMA isn't doing a role. And I think someone mentioned it beautifully in terms of it, calling it a distrust of this organization. And so um, is there a way to verbalize that? What, what, what are they doing wrong, basically? And I think. You know, I'm from Miami personally, and we have tons of hurricanes, but nothing like a major hurricane is something that's going to tell us what the organization is doing wrong. There's no FEMA presence really after the smaller hurricanes, only after larger ones like An Hurricane Andrew, and that was decades ago. So these time points are so far in between that um, it's important to learn from them, even though um, 
it's important to learn from them, and I just wonder um, sort of uh, issues that happen after this. After I think this the disaster. mistrust is reciprocal. If you go to one of these uh, FEMA places in Puerto Rico, like the one that is in front of Casa Pueblo, the first thing you see outside is, is, is guards with weapons. Like they need to get protected somehow <laughs> from the local people. So, you, so you, they, they have guards, like two at least, at each location. Um, so they don't trust the local people somehow, uh, which I think is, is the same from, from people to them. I, I have only one, one anecdote that might illustrate the, the situation. After the hurricane, we, we decided to light up Puerto Rico with the sun, but people in the state they, they decided, oh, no, we want to help with tarps Yeah. because of the roof. Situation is said, you know, if you want to send a few, that's okay, but FEMA is going to take care of that because that's what they do, and they're ready and prepared because that's what they told the people of Puerto Rico, that they had a lot of them in Puerto Rico ready to be set up right after the hurricane because that's something that happens every, every time that you see a hurricane. So... Uh, with Casa Pueblo, we had people from Idaho and others buying tarps, sending them to Houston. Through Houston, we had a, 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 a bridge. Uh, people from Houston, Texas, United for Puerto Rico, put them in a flight. They sent it to San Juan. We got them in San Juan. We drove to Adjuntas. It took you, you can imagine, like, a, like a two weeks, three weeks to do the whole cycle. But we got there in Anjuntas with tarps like three weeks before FEMA show up. And when you, when you think about the, the consequences of the Hurricane Maria damages to, to, to the people's uh, things, of course the, the, the roof of the house was gone because, or partially because of the forces of the wind, but it kept raining. So because of the lack of the tarps, it was no longer the damages to the roof. Now it became the damages to the floor. And it kept raining, and now it was the furniture of the, of the kitchen that got damaged. And all of a sudden, all the damage was amplified because the delay response from FEMA. And if you look about all the, the, the claims that have been denied by, by FEMA statistically, yep. it's overwhelming. Uh, worrying, uh, just as statistically speaking, ab about all the refusal, like two thirds of all the claims have been refused, and only a few is the, is the second or third largest storm in, in the U.S. history, and and yet the, the amount of people that are receiving full support from FEMA is just a few. Um, so there's something wrong uh, with that approach. The same thing with uh, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. They took over of rebuilding the power system, and, and they blame uh, the local government because of the white fish scandals and the signing of the contracts. I mean, th those contracts and the ones that came after white fish, which are equally dishonest, they were... Th th they're deal with the federal government. They blame the local government, but these are these decisions that are not taken by, by the local people. I don't think they were taken by the local people, like they claim. Um, so th there's a, a lot of situations that, that had created a, a broader gap that should not exist. Um, so, but so the gap is getting, getting bigger larger yeah I think um, there's an issue so timing the trust and the timing but also infrastructure like I'm not knowledgeable about Miami but I'm pretty sure that structures are in place that are more efficient to mobilize people and to protect people plus there's a lot of investment there I mean it's not the same it's just back to the problem of the the economic crisis and the colonization of the island and I mean, mobilizing people. I remember when the three, there were 3,000 containers of supplies that were just blocked on the docks and people were not mobilizing. There are a lot of folks contacting each other in despair. Like where are those supplies and what is going on? 
the government didn't have a distribution plan to like mobilize with the, uh, the people who were supposed to pick those up in order to like have a fair distribution of these supplies, therefore they chose not to do that. They were telling the drivers to go online to sign oh, up yeah. to, so they could drive a truck. That was, with the, that was with the that was with the gasoline. Yeah. yeah. The first few. Yeah. 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 And uh, adding on, I think como que, um, Coral has the statistics too, um, and we could divide them, but adding on to, you know, looking at Hurricane Harvey versus Hurricane Maria, for example, Hurricane Harvey, FEMA gave 5.1 million dollars in meals, 4.5 um, liters of, of water, and over 20,000 traps to Texas. While in Puerto Rico, um, he, they gave 1.6 million dollars in meals, 2.8 water and million dollars in water, and 5,000 traps. And so the the difference um, is there. They would they were. 3.5 million dollars more in meals, 1.7 million more water, and 15,000 more traps. And so I think that speaks for itself in that there's, they treated us like a second class, you know, like we aren't part of the United States, but. And yeah. Houston is a city, not a country like Puerto Rico. Yeah. Yeah. But I want to say something about Puerto Rico being treated as a second class citizens. I have to somehow refuse that thing because, uh, I mean, the argument is that because we are U.S. citizens, we should be helped. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Not because we are people. human beings, you know, exactly. people from Puerto Rico that needs help. No, no, it's because we are U.S. citizens. And, and the reason for that is, is that is that if the other islands from nearby Puerto Rico wanted to help Puerto Rico, they're not allowed to do it. Because of the Jones Act. Yeah, exactly. And they want to, and, they and we help them. So they don't help, and they prevent others from helping us. Yep. And, and there's a, a clear example after Hurricane Irma that came through Puerto Rico two weeks before Maria. Barbuda was that badly damaged. And people from Puerto Rico, like every time something happens in the Caribbean, we got organized, we get supplies, and we were sending help to Barbuda when Maria was developing, and yeah. all of a sudden, uh, those were supplies that we needed in Puerto Rico, but you know. Same with Haiti when the but earthquake But it was sent uh, to Barbuda, and we were helping others, and all of a sudden, we, we were unable to get help, like the Cubans, they wanted to send doctors. Yeah. yeah. To help Puerto Ricans and, and, and <laughs> that was not allowed. Yeah, uh, so they they prevent others for, for helping and their response is not in good terms. Yeah, I wanna build on that too. The citizenship is still tied to this idea that the US is gonna save us mm -hmm. and that's a big problem. Be I when I first talked to my mother after two weeks of not knowing where she was, um, she was crying on the phone, but she wasn't crying because of what she needed. She was crying because the glass shattered for them. Like when we move here, we realize, oh, we're Puerto Rican. We're people of color. There's like a whole different context. And we understand what our citizenship means and doesn't mean. But in, in the island, you don't. So she was on the phone crying and saying, how is it possible that we're going through all this and what is being discussed over there where you are? And she's pro statehood which that was like a big thing for her to admit and like for me to hear her say. She was like, what, how is it possible that instead of the discussion being how to help people, the discussion is whether we're citizens or not. And, um, I, and that I think, was crazy. And I think that's rooted to the lack of education in like, you know, this has also made visible what we are, that we exist because yeah. most people in the United States don't know where the hell is Puerto Rico to begin with. Yeah. Like, um, there's a lack of disinform like there's disinformation on our country to begin with, but I totally agree with both of you. Like totally, I I remember um, using the word uh, distrust, referring to uh, like we have to make the distinction between a local and like federal government, and I was using it for like local government. So I was using it uh, because um, there's this journalist called Jay Fonseca that a lot of people follow him, especially in the diaspora. Mm -hmm. And they contacted him and they were like, is there a way that we can help Puerto Rico 
not through local government because the local government created this um, organization called Unidos por Puerto Rico. And a lot of people didn't want to donate uh, to that organization because of previous like, corruption that has happened with the government. And that's why they didn't, like that was the distrust that they had and the one I was referring to. Mm -hmm. um, so they were asking him, is there a way that we can help? Not through that. And he had to create an organization. Like, I don't know where, you know, but he had to uh, make it. Um, you know, w along with other people. So the people that did, like, you know, follow, you know, his his constant, like, updates, you know, would donate through there. And, you know, like, eventually, like, um, Unidos por Puerto Rico, which was the organization that was made, um, announced that they wanted to, with the money that was raised, uh, they wanted to build parks in Puerto Rico. And we don't need parks. We need food. We need water. And, you know, after a while, they didn't go through with that plan. But the fact that they even suggested that, was the the distrust that I feel like people were feeling. Yeah. And I, I just want to kind of remind about the optics as well. Mm. Um, can y'all hear me? Like, do I have to? Yeah. yeah? Um, so I think there, there were a lot of good people working for FEMA who really, I mean, with the best of intentions, were trying to help Puerto Rico. And I mm -hmm. think that needs to be said, um, yeah. because goodness should be appreciated anywhere, right? right. Um, but at the same time, we were dealing with certain optics, um, not least of which um, not my president, Donald Trump, tossing <laughs> paper towels, right? Yeah. Um, so that's an optic that kind of exacerbates anxieties about will we be helped by the sovereign, um, the United States? Um, will they be there for us despite promises, right? Um, kind of contractual obligations. Um, now flying into Puerto Rico in March, I mean, sometime after the, the hurricane has passed, right? Um, I was sitting by um, a few folks who, looking out over um, San Juan as we were descending, said, oh my God, I didn't realize there were so many pools in Puerto Rico. Um, and in fact, oh. what they were looking at were the blue tarps that had been laid out over the, um, the roofs. Um, and so it, it's kind of, it's a very strange thing to fly out over the city and see an absolute lack of ruse, and then to kind of, I don't know, the poet in me finds some kind of dark irony in the fact that, oh my God, look at all the pools, like, oh, in this beautiful resort town, it's so lovely. But like, under that roof is just a kind of suffering that hasn't been spoken, or it's been <coughs> fundamentally, fundamentally misunderstood. Um, so I think the, the optics play a big role in, um, in this distrust um, yeah. on local and federal um, transnational levels. I want to say one last thing. And thank you for that question, because, like, wow, we unpacked a lot. That's pretty amazing. But just back to the issue of citizenship, that it just made clear that, no, we can't assume that just because we're citizens we have access to things. Certainly we've seen this oppression in Standing Rock and Flint and all these other places. So this is why the issue of Puerto Rico is so important beyond us. It's an issue of democracy in general in this country where specific communities are colonized and attacked and disenfranchised on purpose. It's systematic. So I just want to highlight that because a lot of folks, it's when we talk about this, it's so great that we're in a community of people from different places because it is a U.S., like, it is, it is a countrywide issue. It's not just a Puerto Rico issue. Yeah. I also want to add, like, as a kind of, I'm sorry, non sequitur, and I appreciate that intervention. Um, I feel like it's also bad economics, right? If, from the perspective of a colonizer, right, um, if I, Puerto Rico owes me a tremendous debt, Mm -hmm. Why would I not protect my investment? Um, mm -hmm. That's something that's kind of curious to me, right? Because Puerto Rico owes a lot of people a lot of money. And a lot of those loans were illegal, absolutely illegal, with 400, 300, 400% interest rates. I mean, it's like absurd, right? When we um, unpack those numbers and look at the statistics. Um, and this I'm getting from a Hedge Clippers article. Mm -hmm. um, but why hasn't the U.S. protected its investment? Does it not expect to get this money back? And if so, what, what is happening? What is the expectation of Puerto Rico? Uh, what do we do with these austerity measures which yeah. are now killing education, as was mentioned before? Um, is killing the land? Uh, and yeah. In the back. Um, I lead a Brown Christian Fellowship here on campus, and during spring break, we brought 
um, 31 students from Brown to Puerto Rico to help out from the Tournament Supreme Court trip. Um, we plan on going back year after year. Um, I'm just wondering, what are some of the NGOs, some of the nonprofits that we should be collaborating with um, that we can actually use some of this free labor to actually do some of this thing? I think you're the best one to speak to that. Me? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, I know, I know Casa Pueblo. Uh, <laughs> But actually, I was talking to Seth, how uh, complicated, because we, I know a lot of people wants to go there to help, and we're extremely busy working and, 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 and for groups to go to Puerto Rico, they better have a clear agenda uh, and how, what they want to accomplish and, and be as self-sufficient <laughs> as possible in order to help the people of Puerto Rico. Um, but Casa Pueblo is doing that with a group from University of Michigan. There's some group from Arizona. We're getting a lot of calls, but um, it, it is overwhelming. I, I think uh, there's other groups like like Mariana in 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 Umacao. I know some community leaders in in, in Loiza, uh, in which they need a lot of help. Uh, in rebuilding, it's not so much about the energy agenda, but it's rebuilding their houses because the energy is back, so it's, it's fixing their houses, and they're not getting the support, and, and FEMA is not helping because they don't own the house, so, so they don't get the support, but they have to fix the house because they, it's still their land. Uh, um, so, so I will, if you ask me, I, I will say Loisa will be one, Vieques, uh, Idebajo, in Salinas, and and I think that there's a lot of uh, NGOs uh, which are very responsible and, and actively engaged, uh, but we'll we'll need to, to look for, for, for their contact information. Yeah, there are lists out there that we've all been mobilizing. Okay. Um, I can't really point to a specific place to find them, mm -hmm. but um, Casa if you look up Casa Pueblo in Google, they'll probably be with the, le the all the, the rest of the NGOs that we've been supporting. I also want to commend you. I'm, I'm glad to hear that Christian brothers and sisters are going down um, to do work. Uh, Puerto Rico is nothing if not pious, right? So there's like a church on every yeah. corner. <laughs> yeah. Um, and while I was down there, somebody was trying to, um, they were like, why, you know, do you know why? Christ died for you, and I'm like, yeah, man, I know. <laughs> <laughs> and he was surprised. He was like, oh. Was like, yeah. <laughs> um, That's so That's so, a good point. Um, Puerto Rico is a very religious place, um, very Christian, um, and it has its own kind of Christian identity, which is something that I'm sure you've encountered as well. Um, but I, having worked with Mentes Puerto Riqueña en Acción, I, I know those people now. I've worked with them. I feel very comfortable with them. They're primarily young people um, that are either out of UPR, the, the university system there, or um, are still students there. They also recruit people um, from, from universities outside. Um, and so while I was down there, I was working with uh, a Japanese photographer who was living in um, Massachusetts, and um, a university professor and his two kids, and um, a bunch of students. and. It was an interesting group of people, and I think Mentes is another group um, with Casa Pueblo that you can check out. Um, they're really amenable to groups of people, and they would be happy um, to connect with you. And I like Mentes Puerto Rican, yes. We had worked with them before, and uh, they're very bright and committed people. Um, and they have sustained uh, their effort for years, so, and building on, on, on what they do. So. Yeah, actually, a um, uh, student contacted me today telling me if there's any way that I could um, say this during the, the panel. But I guess I'll take advantage now. Uh, she's partnering with um, Dr. Jani Santos, which is a doctor here in Rhode Island who works in the Rhode Island, Rhode Island Hospital, who's helping people who have been displaced from Puerto Rico and are here in Rhode Island to help them connect with um, Rhode Island Hospital to help them uh, with health services. To me, health is like I guess the most important thing when it comes to you know being in need. So I guess you could contact um, her, uh, Janice Santos, J A N I C E Santos. So yeah, you can see if if that works. Cool. All right.
so thank you for doing this. It's really incredible. Um, you know, I'm Paulo Rodriguez. I, um, the president of Latino Public Radio, not on the air anymore, but uh, during the hurricane, we were on the air all day, every day, uh, trying to get information to people. And one of the issues that we ran into, and I felt like San Juan Bautista, la boca predica en el desierto. San Juan Bautista is the St. John the Baptist uh, voice that preaches in the desert uh, about what you mentioned about water. Um, people were going to supermarkets and spending $20 on a, on a case of little bottles of water because they needed to do something, because they felt the need to contribute. Uh, and I kept going on the air telling people, please do not buy water. Uh, because what, what are you doing? You are, right now there are still containers here in the States that have not been able to make it to Puerto Rico because they were able to collect them, but they were not able to send them. They didn't have enough money to distribute them. And then they didn't have anybody to give it to in Puerto Rico because they didn't have the connections. And I'm wondering if there is an effort to get some lessons learned of the things that we shouldn't do because everybody wants to do something. And there was an incredible mobilization of the diaspora, but it was a very inefficient and wasteful um, uh, movement. Um, and I was getting the calls, you know, so Pablo, do you know anybody that has a plane? And I'm like, you yeah. know, no, I don't know anybody that, that, that has a plane. And, and, and that was the problem because people felt that they had to do something. When in reality, the easiest thing would have been to donate funds to the organizations that are already on the ground doing the work today as opposed to waiting for three months for a bottle of water to get to Puerto Rico. Um, and then have to Puerto Rico deal with the plastic of yeah. all these bottles, the garbage that yeah. had no place to go. Mm -hmm. So it was just such an incredible waste um, uh, of effort. So uh, I'm wondering if anybody, any organization is putting this together so next time, because it's gonna happen again, you know, we're gonna have another hurricane. This, that's a guarantee, and possibly as big um, as Maria, uh, we have to be prepared to be more efficient and more um, resourceful in terms of what to do. Uh, the second point that I wanted to make, and maybe because I'm a gynecologist, I, I, all, all I think sometimes is in those terms. Um, I am very concerned that after all this time with no electricity, uh, no school, you have a lot of teenagers getting pregnant having sex. There's no lights, there's no school, there's no TV. What do we do? We have sex. Uh, so I'm very concerned. Uh, and the pharmacies are closed, so there was no birth control pills, there's no condoms, there's no IUDs, there's no doctors. Um, so I'm wondering, you know, what's happening with that, especially as the summer is coming. And you're going to have a lot of pregnancies um, uh, developing uh, as the Zika um, uh, epidemic will continue, which it will continue, and now with all the all the water and and the lack of sanitation, um, we we could be facing a second wave of crisis for Puerto Rico. I don't want to joke about that, but we need more Puerto Ricans, so yeah. <laughs> maybe that's a good thing. <laughs> um, no, no, and but but I, I but. I, I just want to clarify that water is a key issue, and water was very important. In Anjuntas, water initially was, was, was important, but not so much after the first uh, few days, let's say after the, after the hurricane. But for example, for Umacao in the coastal area, for Vieques, for Loiza, providing water was a key thing. So I don't want to say that we should completely avoid the water agenda because, well, yeah, it, it's important. Uh, but I think that can be locally produced in, in Puerto Rico even after a hurricane. I don't see why we needed to, you know, chip water from, from outside. Uh, I mean, out of all the dependencies, having water dependency in Puerto Rico is, is a shame. Um, but but building a different Puerto Rico needs to address the issue. How, how are we gonna provide water to others in the island? Can, can we accomplish that? I think that's very doable. Mm -hmm. um, and I think uh, the, I, I, in general with the diaspora, at least with Casa Pueblo, I, I will say that had been very, very effective. Uh, I can, 
I can say that in few occasions we got some old clothing and, and things that, you know, that people get rid of from their house when they want to help others. But that was a very, very uh, tiny instances of, of getting unnecessary support. Most of the support we channeled through Casa Pueblo was well intended, well channeled, uh, very diverse in occasions, uh, complicated for us in Casa Pueblo because it, it was so many different uh, new duties. Uh, but I think they were kind of effective. And I think it's getting about the time for people in the diaspora to get together with people from Puerto Rico and actually address that issue on how to build up on what we have done so far in order to be more effective in the future. So I think uh, that's a, something that need, needs to be done. So a few things too, because like it's a broader thing. Um, it's about responsible community organizing and the fact that it's like you can wake up one day and like want to be the savior of the universe, but there's so many best practices people have already created and there are professionals who have been doing this work with many kinds of communities out there. So it's about connecting with the people who already have the tools in place and then making sure that people understand community organizing is a skill and it's, a, <laughs> It's a, uh, people have built legacies of knowledge on it. So to go frantic is not, uh, to go frantic and trying to figure out, oh, I want to do something, I'm just going to buy a bag, like a bag of water filters and just like feel like I completed something. It's just completely irresponsible. I totally agree. So I've just been encouraging people to look into how other groups mobilize and then connect with them. And also, so the diaspora did, a few of us did um, push toward just small scale um, funding for people to have money for their own families. And then also sending support to specific local organizations, which was the best advice. And that advice was going, running around. But I do think that there was a missed opportunity to, to accomplish something bigger. And I'm excited and hopeful that we can continue to build upon the longevity of what we can learn and what we can create. Now with the diaspora, it's like, well, we can hold people accountable from over here. Like we can hold the government accountable here. And it's about advocacy. It's about getting into political roles. It's about making sure people are registered for voting. It's about making sure that who is helping Puerto Ricans that have left in our own state. Very few people are. I just know of Dorcas International in Rhode Island and Brown University that extend it to the UPR. And it's really great to hear about what she's doing as well. But yeah, I feel like it's a broader conversation about responsible community organizing and understanding that we just need to connect to professionals who do the work. That's why many of us connected with Casa Pueblo because they've been doing the work for a long time. Any other questions? Okay, I have a question about how um, I think Puerto Rico has a historical problem of patching things up. Uh, solutions that are meant to be temporary are extended until they're no longer sustainable. Uh, that happens with our pa energy system, our water system. So um, I was just wondering how people here in the U.S. can help keep the government accountable, both the federal government and the local government, regarding those issues. About just I think that's something like FEMA with the with the tolos, like that's not gonna, s like when another hurricane comes, those people don't actually have a roof. But they keep up fixing the electrical system, it's another hurricane is gonna destroy it instead of just switching to another system. And in Puerto Rico, we can, like, there's not so much we can do. I feel like the, both colonization and uh, corporate interests within the local government are keeping us from fixing those issues. So, how can people over here? Con, like contribute to the de development of sustainability in Puerto Rico. I feel, yeah, that, that's kind of like the, the issue that I have with resilience, right? Like we're used to patching things up, but what we need is a fundamental redress of infrastructure. And so yeah, holding local politicians accountable, um, even just in Rhode Island, right? Making them aware of certain situations in Puerto Rico that need redress. Um, but there's this song, and I'm sorry again, I'm very like poetry, literary minded, but there's a song that I really love by Juan Luis Guerra that I, everybody knows, Ojalá que llueva café en el campo, right? Like there's, there's a part of me that um, 
is it going to take another catastrophe? And is it, does it take this kind of dreamer mentality for us to recognize that power system is broken? Like, we keep putting Band-Aids on it. Today, yeah. there is an apagón. Like, right now, there's mm -hmm. no light in any corner of Puerto Rico. And it's going to take 24 to 48 hours yep. before the Band-Aid comes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Not in Casa Pueblo, because, hello, a solar energy. I mean, <laughs> and, no, I, o sea, I think it, it, we go back to what Arturo was saying of not being dependent and, and, and sustainability is, is the answer and, and kind of, you know, building on sustainability from all the aspects possible and like sovereignty as well. Um, but of course, the question remains like, how, how can we do that? Um, there's multiple strategies too. So it's empowering the community grassroots or organizations, but really holding our government officials accountable. And we can do that. We live here, we can vote. So there's a window of manipulation that you can exert where it's like, I, I'm here, I'm voting, I'm paying attention to you and these are my issues and you better respond. Mm -hmm. And you can tweet, you can write letters, you can pay attention to stuff that other community organizi uh, organizations in Puerto Rico are trying to push. Like now there's a, a push of a few um, artists that have been squatting in neighborhoods in Santurce to try to revitalize these spaces and turn them into community spaces. There's no legislation that allows people to develop um, buildings that are considered public nuisance. Mm -hmm. And they're owned by the government, and the government is just sitting there. And people want to like live in them and create them as community spaces. So cool, once that legislation is out, helping to push that shit. Because then that means that all these other people can develop and activate these spaces. So I feel like keeping on point with people who are doing advocacy, I don't know if you want to like drop some knowledge around some of the advocacy that you've done, because I know you've done a lot of activism in the past with the organization. But to me, it's both, it's both ways, empowering grassroots and then also holding government accountable, because they still have power. And I, I kind of want to, um, not to put it all on you again, Arturo, but like <laughs> just jumping um, off of the question, I think one thing for sure, it might feel futile, you know, or pointless to do that, like, but it's, it's important. I think it's a fundamental part of belief that we need more of. We need more people to believe that we have power and agency, and until we reach that critical mass, nothing is gonna happen. We're just gonna keep putting the bandit on. People are gonna keep profiting who don't need to be profiting. But on the ground, because Arturo, you've done so much work with solar energy, why isn't solar energy ubiquitous in Puerto Rico? Like, what is the impediment um, that that you found? Um, I'm no, I know Casa Pueblo can only do so much, but I feel like there's a kind of institutional, structural, governmental impediment to solar power becoming um, more widespread on the island. But we're no longer a minority. Maybe in 1999, uh, but you have to understand that that power generation is Puerto Rico is run by the fossil fuel industry and they want to keep it that way and they want to stop the advances in, in clean energy sources as much as possible so we're facing the same thing than, than you know, other people elsewhere uh, but people are more aware and, and we're changing uh, and I think um, like, like there's a broader understanding of the ne not the opportunity of the necessity to generate <coughs> energy at the point of consumption. Uh, and we have the option, the technological possibilities are out there. With regard to the advocacy, we have done it, and, um, and, and, and yes, I, I do agree with, with you. In, in our case, we are, you know, we are a small organization, and uh, we have limitation, and I think we all run with limited resources. So we have to think about how to be more effective. And uh, we believe in every single effort. Like, for example, when we were facing the government uh, with uh, his pipeline proposal and it was getting nasty, some people were praying for us. And I said, well, is that your way to help us <laughs> go out and pray? I mean, if, if that's what you believe, at least you're doing something. And I think we, we need a diversity of responses. Uh, and all of them need to be addressed. However, however, 
I'm glad you went to Toa Alta, you said? Uh, Toa Baja. Toa Baja to help directly. And I think uh, if you were expecting the government to change the situation in Puerto Rico, mm -hmm. I think we're wasting our time. Absolutely. Because it's not going to happen. If you're gonna make politicians accountable, they have been doing whatever they want, regardless if, if you make them accountable. So in our case, if we have limited energy and resources, uh, help the people of Mariana, help the people of Tuabaja, help them be more self-sufficient to engage actively in dealing with the recovery part of, of Hurricane Maria, but then think, to think about all the necessities that that community already have. Uh, and perhaps by using the same community approach, they, they can deal with, with it and, and, and change that reality. So in our case, our most, uh, our advocacy call will be to actively get engaged for the people of Puerto Rico to gain social power. If we gain social power by doing at a broader landscape, that social power will somehow cancel or could be used to face the political unbalance, the economical unbalance and disparities that Puerto Rico is facing. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. Let me say the last part. You, 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 me, we are all privileged. We got an education and we have a, we own a responsibility. Mm -hmm. We own a moral responsibility to do something not only for your future employer. You have a moral obligation with your family, with your community, and will, with your country. And I think, I hope <laughs> you will obey that moral responsibility like Coro, Caterina, and everyone is doing here in, 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 in Brown University because you're doing something. You're using that knowledge to create awareness or to help to channel help to the local people of Puerto Rico, but much more is, is needed. So I want to thank Seth for the opportunity and the organizers uh, for being able to be here to share what we have been doing and what we want to accomplish. All right, thank you. Thank you.